All right, welcome to the Foreign Saints uh, YouTube channel. I told you guys in the last Bible study video I was going to have some Juneteenth content. I meant it. I uh, got my Juneteenth shirt repping. I uh, got my mom here. Uh, spirit of the Juneteenth for sure. Um, we're just going to have a short little conversation um, just, just on the holiday and some of the ramifications of it, especially now that it's nationally recognized federal holiday. So um, without further ado, um, just wanted to let you guys know this is my mom um definitely smarter than me uh in a lot of ways and i just wanted to get her thoughts on what juneteenth means and what it means to her so without further ado let her have the mic man oh wow hi everyone as he said i am lashana i am dakari's mom and um i'm happy to be here before you guys today it's a little different being on this Maybe end when I'm usually the on the, um, the 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 watch end, and now I'm kind of on the end where I'm speaking before a mass of people. So it's great to be here, and I'm excited. Um, and so Dakari, being Dakari, you know, asked a great and loaded question: um, What does Juneteenth mean to me? Um, it means several things to me. Um, when I think of Juneteenth, especially in light of it being passed as a national holiday, I think about what it means for our community as a whole. What it means for our community as a whole is that we are finally recognized for a historic milestone in the lives of our people in the United States at a time when we were not considered for humans we were not considered citizens and in a time where we unselfishly fought for and celebrated the nation's independence though we had not our own and so in light of juneteenth emancipation day freedom day or some reference it as jubilee um it means that we finally have that recognition in the U.S. that this was an important milestone for us as a people. But I also want to stress that while it recognizes a milestone in our community, it does not belong solely to us. And I want to stress that because I, I need people to understand that this is truly an American holiday. These are things that took place in America. We fought for America when we didn't have um, our own freedom. And so that speaks to a lot of just um, self-sacrificing. Um, and, and, you know, we learn about that all throughout the Bible where people are willing to sacrifice themselves for a greater good. And so even in that, and in that, that time that was a dark time, um, we still find ways to triumph. And so today we get to celebrate that it is nationally recognized um, across this nation. And so it is just um, a victory for us as a people, but also a victory for America. All right, just had to get some good words of wisdom there. And it um, feels kind of weird to kind of even presume to add on to that but one thing i do want to add is me personally I also see it as a vindication at least in part for all of the all of the black and white but especially the black saints the black christians that came before and you know allowed jesus to really speak um to their pain um i heard a poem by uh poet preston perry um, and he just had a very poignant line in the poem. He said that, you know, African-American slaves allowed Jesus to be their comfort amongst the heat um, and allowed him to be their shade in the midst of Mississippi poplar trees. And it just got me thinking that this day is an important milestone, an important link in a chain that ultimately leads to the day when the heart of what Juneteenth is about will be fulfilled in the day when Jesus comes back um, to establish his kingdom on the earth. That's going to be the ultimate Juneteenth, not just for us, but for all, um, but for all oppressed minorities um, the world over as well. 
Um, but what I mean by vindication is it also shows that it shows that the word of God isn't broken when it would say things in the New Testament like the one that trusts in the Lord shall not be put to shame. And many of our people were treated shamefully by outsiders and insiders alike for trusting in the way of Jesus, even when the way of Jesus, which calls for loving of one's enemies, even in the midst of pursuing freedom when you have the opportunity, seems like a foolish way to pursue it even when it seems like a foolish way to pursue it. But as is proven throughout history and through the scriptures, Jesus knows what he's talking about. And as Preston Perry said in his poem, I'll put a, um, I'll put a link to it in this, in this video. Um, but as he said in his poem, there's no way that Jesus and the Father don't see the struggles of our people when they're seated on the throne that high. All right, so let Juneteenth stand as an evidence that every single prayer of desperation of our people for the last four centuries was heard was cataloged not a single tear was wasted um at the altar of the father and it's just it's just something to recognize because you know as i'm sure you know mom's going to point out is that you know the battle's not done like Juneteenth doesn't mean that you're in New Jerusalem yet doesn't mean that the kingdom's here there's still work to do all right the image of God in brown people is still being disrespected and put down on the world over even in this nation even as we take today to you know to praise jesus for how far people have come and recognizing the image of god in us all right and there's and there's a lot more to be said just on on the nuance of all of this but as far as my thoughts on it that's just kind of that's just kind of big picture you know vindication for the saints that came before and proof of jesus's faithfulness to african-american christians that jesus is going to call um to their walks today and onwards um into the future um anything anything else to to add i suppose no i think you summed it up um precisely and succinctly um god's word is is never void um, and so I think this is something that we have to recognize that even when we are going through a storm, we have to trust the process. Storms are not going to feel good. Um, you know, you think about all the storms, um, you know, different groups of people went uh, through in the Bible. And so what makes us so special to think that we will not have to walk through storms? Um, you know, uh, the time of, you know, slavery in, in America, um, and, and even, um, you know, back in Africa, um, were not good times uh, for our, our people. Um, but as Dakari said, you always have to cling uh, to God's word and just knowing and having a relationship with him to know that, you know, if you just ride it out. He didn't say that you would be absent of storms. He said that he would be with you through the storms. And so if you just keep that um, perspective, um, like our ancestors did, you know, they, they clung to, to God. They had special songs that they would sing, um, giving him reverence while at the same time helping us to, to lead us out of the way and out of the bondage of slavery. And so, um, you know, Dakari's right. You saw that constant um, clinging to God, um, even in the worst times of their life, because what I, what I have come to recognize is if you have hope, um, and hope is also another word, I believe, for faith. If you have hope, the Bible says you only need a mustard seed. You only need a mustard seed. You don't need this grandiose measure of hope or faith. All you need is a little bit. And if you surround yourself with other people that have more of the little bit, you can collectively um, collect a, a, a grand measure of the little thing that you have. And so that is also um, a powerful um, measure of God in itself. When you put yourself and surround yourself with other people who have that same hope and that same faith, what you can do when you amass yourself together. Now, our ancestors, all they had was hope. Some of them died never seeing this day. Some of them died never seeing the day of freedom but they had a hope and they had a faith that it would come and we are at that point where we are free and so now that we are free how will we loose 
that mentality of imprisonment that we have allowed ourselves to kind of stay in for some of us how do we run with that freedom and carry on the torch that they handed off to us um and so again i think he i think he summed that up succinctly and um i think the work still um has to continue there's more work to be done um we celebrate this victory because it is worthy of celebration um but there's also more work to be done and so we just carry forward with that in the faith and in the hope of god all right good words good words good words all right so i just wanted to take the time um just to really give you guys a peek into something that many of you guys just might not have access to like i'm i'm no idiot i'm not going to pretend that everyone's got access um you know to the african-american community to really understand or even just have access to um, a conversation on it and that's part of why i made this channel um foreign saints isn't just for the saints overseas in china and in malaysia even though i care deeply for them they're also for the tales of saints that would be foreign to you even though they live domestically all right so as um as this segment of the episode uh continues i'm going to transition uh to the board of wisdom uh, my one note whiteboard and we're gonna be looking at some stories from the underground church in america's history which is the african american church and really look into how they while they were outwardly prisoners didn't walk as prisoners in their situations and how that can speak to um you know speak some boldness into your christian witness and preaching the kingdom of god um in this generation and in being able to have your faith communities better match the diversity that we see prophesied as will be representative of God's people in Revelation. All right, because the book of Revelation tells us that around God's throne is going to be a multitude of people from every tribe, nation, language, and tongue. All right, so why not start living in that sort of faith community now if those are the sorts of faith communities that are going to be existing in the eschaton, in the eternal age? All right, so peace all right and here we are at the board of wisdom to continue uh, the conversation on juneteenth what it means and what jesus is really trying to communicate to his people even through you know this this event um and it gives me the opportunity like i said in the in the previous clip to really talk about um the histories of a whole different kind of underground church that many of us don't actually recognize as the underground church which would be the african-american slave church in this very nation um for the last century for the last few centuries really um but before we get into the histories i wanted to really dive in and see what scripture has to say about how the gospel really gets in to the master slave relationship and breaks down assumptions breaks down um viewpoints um, in that relationship and builds new humanity relationships, all right? Builds a new humanity out of the old humanity where we subjugate each other, right? So, let's go ahead and open up. Um, what you see here on the screen is the short, short, short little book of Philemon, all right? In my Bible, look at how small the book actually is, right? This book is not very big at all but it does have huge implications for the gospel and really our conversation on slavery which has a direct uh relation to our conversation on juneteenth all right so we're just going to read the whole letter i'm going to read it in one shot um and we're going to talk about some things along the way all right but a little bit of background information all right we see here at the start we see here at the start here, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so that's our intro right there. That's our intro. Paul's a prisoner right now. He's writing to a dude named Philemon, who Paul describes as a fellow worker. A fellow worker in the gospel, all right, and Aphia, their sister, and Archippus, and also they're greeting the whole church in his house. 
All right, now, I'm going to tell you straight up the reason he's writing to uh, Philemon is because Philemon owned a slave in the Roman system. And that slave's name was Onesimus. And I do think I'm saying his name right. Onesimus was the slave. Philemon was the master. Onesimus ran away. Onesimus ran away from Philemon, his master. And during Onesimus' time away from Philemon, he, ran, he runs into Paul, as Jesus would have it. And Paul preaches the gospel to Onesimus. Onesimus gets saved and becomes a Christian. And so Paul is writing this letter to Philemon to convince Philemon to accept Onesimus back, not as his slave, but as his equal, as his brother in Christ. <laughs> All right, so let's hear what he has to say. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have towards the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. All right, so this, so this Philemon guy, you know, he's doing some work for the church, man. Refreshing the hearts of the saints. All right, even giving, you know, joy and comfort to Paul. You know, but, you know, but let's, uh, let's keep going. And oh, by the way, this isn't like a hardcore super exegesis of Philemon, the way I'm doing in my Luke series. For that, I would need to devote between one and three videos to this book to do that. We're just doing a faster read through, but that's okay. That's okay. That's why it's on the screen for you guys. And you've got your own Bibles to look it up and dissect it at your own leisure if you want to. Um, accordingly, accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. He's talking spiritually. Parentheses, formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. Unparentheses. I'm sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would, ha I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel, but I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this, perhaps, is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me. But how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord? So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it, to say nothing of your owing me even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I'm hoping that through your prayers I will be graciously given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. All right, the Mark and the Luke that are talked about there are the authors of the Gospels of Mark and Luke, respectively. So you kind of see the inner uh, connectedness of the body even there. And of course, I love what Paul says here, uh, confident of your obedience, I write to you. Knowing you'll do even more than I say. But Paul's no idiot, so of course, at the same time, prepare a guest room for me. Alright? Like, he's encouraging, but he's also kind of backhanded. Like, hey, I am I do intend to come down there and check to make sure that you're actually treating uh, Onesimus the way that you ought to. Right? But consider what he says. Consider what he says. Uh, you're just going to have to follow along with me because I'm not using verse numbers. Um, consider what he says. For this, perhaps, is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me. But how much more to you? 
both in the flesh and in the Lord. All right, what Paul is saying to Philemon is that your intention for Onesimus was for him to simply be a servant in your house, but God had a bigger plan for Onesimus. God's plan for Onesimus was to make him a son, was to make him a son of the Most High, and by extension, to make him your equal brother now, not your lower servant, not your lower servant. And so, Philemon, I'm writing to you to tell you that you better extend the grace of Jesus Christ that was extended to you to your former slave Onesimus. To your former slave Onesimus because he is your brother in Christ. Because he's your brother in Christ. And there are some people that would say, oh, okay, that's convenient. So Christians shouldn't enslave other Christians, but Christians can enslave non-Christians, yeah? Which is how some people throughout history have, you know, tried to twist Philemon. All right, to which I say, no, no. What's the Great Commission? Go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. All right, if that is your life aim, and it should be for the Christian, if your life aim is to bring other people to Jesus, that means that your life aim is to make other people your spiritual equal. All right, and the only way that you can really go about doing that is to follow the commands of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Love everyone. Love God, love people. Those are the, great, those are the two greatest commandments. The Lord your God is one. Love him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. All right? Would you consider it loving to slap you in irons? To slap you in irons and treat you as a servant, treat you as a slave? No. No. So the idea... So the idea of the gospel, the, the truth of the gospel gets into the master slave relationship and it humbles the master and it elevates the slave to this equal footing before the cross of Christ because both needed their sins uh, forgiven. Both needed to be washed clean by the blood and both have zero chance before the bar of justice in heaven. And both are equally undeserving of the mercy that they both received. So how dare, how dare I subjugate my brother when his worth is literally the blood of the God that saved me? How dare I? How dare I? And how dare I treat those that don't know Jesus as the scum of the earth just because they don't know Jesus? Like... I mean, if I'm going to start doing stuff like that, I might as well just toss the Great Commission out the window. I'm no longer living to build Jesus' kingdom. I'm living to build my kingdom on the backs of slaves and servants. Not trying to build the kingdom of Jesus by becoming a servant myself and serving those that the rest of society would ignore. That the rest of society would ignore. All right, and this isn't the only place in Scripture that talks about God's about God's effect on human cultures being freedom. I mean, the whole arc of the Bible is towards freedom, right? Like Adam, I mean, God creates, um, you know, creation free to flourish in life. Adam sins, brings the whole creation into the bondage, the slavery of death, destruction, and brings all of humanity into the slavery of sin and the flesh. And we see God working through his people, um, in working on behalf of his people, really, in Egypt to bring them out of slavery. And that whole narrative was always a picture of the gospel, from the Passover lamb's blood uh, covering the doorpost to them consuming the Passover lamb once they're underneath the protection of the blood to them being carried through the waters as whoops no not right now not right now friend I'm preaching let me uh yeah hit that don't disturb um and then they were carried through the waters of through the waters of the Red Sea as like unto baptism you know into the wilderness like it's all it's all a lived parable of what the Christian life is supposed to be, all right? Over and over again, there were plenty of times when Israel was judged by God for having slaves, for having slaves and treating people unfairly, all right? And what God would say to them, I think of passages like in Jeremiah, where God through Jeremiah would uh, judge his people saying, is this the people I saved from slavery? 
And now you're going to turn around and start doing the same thing to these foreigners. How dare you? How dare you? All right? And Jesus comes and brings liberation from our sin. Brings liberation from the powers that be. All right? And Paul is even going to instruct a slave, hey, treat your masters right. All right? Live rightly before your masters. Because at the end of the day, all this is for the kingdom of God. All right? Even in your subjugation, you got to live as a kingdom citizen. But... If providentially you are able to have an avenue towards your escape, towards your freedom, take it. Take it. All right. With your hope set on the day when Jesus comes and sets up his kingdom, as I said earlier in this video, and restores creation to the freedom that it's supposed to be lived in. And it's supposed to be lived in, right? The New Testament tells us that people that are enslavers are in sin. And the revelation of Jesus Christ, the final book of the Bible, chapter 18, when it's talking about uh, when it's talking about Babylon, 18 or 19, when it's talking about Babylon, one of the defining features of that Babylon was that they traded in slaves, and the scriptures go out of their way to not just say slaves, but it says they traded in slaves comma space which is human souls all right the bible has always equated slaves as actual people which has not been the case in this nation which has not been the case in this nation all right and that brings me uh to something i wanted to show you guys here as far as history uh, the secret religion of the slaves all right and we're gonna have we're gonna have full-blown videos because the people because some of the historical figures here really do deserve their own videos in my uh in my martyrs playlist uh, maybe i'll make a separate one for historical martyrs i don't know um but the secret religion of the slaves and look at this subtitle they often risked floggings to worship god they often risk floggings to worship god is this america or is this china today or is this the Middle East today? Or is this India today? Risking floggings to worship the God of the Bible? You better believe it. That's what was happening. All right. Now, I don't have uh, I don't have a subscription to this. So all we're going to be able to see is the intro. But I think the intro is telling enough. By the eve of the Civil War, Christianity had pervaded the slave community. Not all slaves were Christian, nor were all those who accepted Christianity members of a church. But the doctrines, symbols, and vision of life preached by Christianity were familiar to most. The religion of the slaves was both visible and invisible, formerly organized and spontaneously adapted. Regular Sunday worship in the local church was paralleled by illicit, or at least informal, prayer meetings on weeknights in the slave cabins. Preachers licensed by the church and hired by the master were supplemented by slave preachers licensed only by the spirit. I love that licensed only by the spirit that's all the license you need baby right there man texts from the bible which most slaves could not read were explicated by verses from the spirituals slaves forbidden by matt the, and the spirituals by the way were the songs that they would sing all right and they were called spirituals um out of a verse from ephesians where paul would you know instruct would inform the churches hey when you gather together you know build each other up with you know a hymn and a, and a spiritual song you know, um, I'll put the verse down there, but that's why they call their song spirituals after the verse in Ephesians. Slaves forbidden by masters to attend church or in some cases even to pray risked floggings to attend secret gatherings to worship God. His own experience of the invisible institution was recalled by former slave Wash Wilson. Quote, when the niggers go around singing, steal away to Jesus, that mean they're going to be religious meeting that night the masters didn't like them religious meetings so us naturally slips off at night down in the bottoms or somewhere sometimes to sing and pray all night Can you imagine that singing the praises of jesus christ and praying to him and his father all night all night all right and many of you guys are getting many of you guys get mad at the fact that church runs a little long sometimes Many of y'all get mad that church runs a little long sometimes. All right, they understood the privilege that it was to be able to come into communion with Jesus and his Father. And they didn't even let the true beastly, and I do mean that in the sense of the book of Revelation, beastly Christianity of the day, stop them from getting to the true Jesus. 
Didn't let it stop him from getting to the true Jesus. All right. So African Americans today, minority today, don't let the nonsense that you've definitely seen in Christianity today keep you from getting to the real Jesus. All right. If the slaves could find the real Jesus in the midst of what they were going through, you can dang sure believe that you can find Jesus in the midst of what you're going through. In the midst of what you're going through. But it, but it's going to take everything you got. It's going to take everything you got. Sometimes they sing and pray all night. Slaves frequently were moved to hold their own religious meetings out of disgust for the vitiated gospel preached by their master's preachers. Lucretia Alexander explained what slaves did when they grew tired of the white folks preacher. The preacher came and he'd just say, serve your masters. Don't steal your master's turkey. Don't, you know, and yada and yada and yada. Does that even sound like Christianity? I mean, sure. You know, stealing somebody's turkey is wrong, but I mean, if you've got the opportunity to preach Jesus to a group of enslaved individuals, what you going to tell them? What you going to tell them? I hope it's better than this. I hope it's better than this. And even worse, I hope you're not using your, uh, I hope you're not using your Christianity as a way of subjugating minorities or using the things of Jesus to try to quench the uh to try to quench the wailings of you know of hurting uh, minority groups all right because if that's the case you're definitely going against the spirit of the psalms all right you are definitely going against the spirit of the psalms if that is the case all right i mean heck man psalm 17 is talking about here just cause the lord attend to my cry all right david being oppressed and he's crying out to the lord uh, and he's crying out to the Lord uh, for help. All right, uh, Psalm 10, you know, a, a, a prayer of lament, really, um, for why it seems like God hides himself from those that, uh, from those that really need him and why it seems like, um, you know, the arrogant, the boastful, and the ones that are truly not godly seem to get what it is they're after all the time. And the place where all the prayers of the psalmist would always coalesce is waiting on the Lord, all right? God of all the earth will surely do right or surely do right. All right. And if this, is, and if, I mean, this is just, I mean, it's not like I've changed or anything. Like I'm still preaching the same Bible that I preach on all my other videos, you know, and yet for whatever reason it's, it's popular. There's a popular strain of Christianity today that seems to think that that seems to think that the gospel stops at just getting the informational content of the message across and not resulting in a life transformation that even gets down to the cultural level. I mean, what do you think John the Baptist meant when he said all dead trees are going to be cut down? You know, trees that don't bear good fruit are getting cut down. All right. Click the video on the card, you know, to see even John the Baptist talk about this stuff. The gospel has social implications and I'm getting sick and tired of seeing, you know, so-called gospel preachers and gospel ministers either in sin, either in blatant sin and rebellion, or just in error, you know, preaching that the gospel, preaching that a, preaching that the gospel, if it becomes social, now becomes this heretical social gospel. And I get it. Like I said, I've preached in my other videos. Jesus didn't come to fix society per se. He came to fix humanity. He came to save humanity from their own sin. And to, and um, he's going to come again to build up his own kingdom in his own way. That being said, it doesn't negate the truth that you got to serve and love your neighbor in the love of Christ. All right. So just some book recommendations. Uh, just some book recommendations to you know to continue the reading while I move on to something else. Um, Esau McCulley's uh, Reading While Black, uh, African American Biblical Interpretation as an Exercise in Hope. As an exercise in hope. All right, this is a this is a really really amazing read. Really amazing read. Um, Esau McCulley, Ph.D. out of St. Andrews, assistant professor of New Testament at Wheaton College, a priest in the Anglican Church in North America, and a contributing opinion writer for the New York Times. All right. Um, some of his other works include Sharing in the Son's Inheritance, um, along with a bunch of articles and outlets from Christianity Today to uh, the Washington Post. All right. Good stuff. Good stuff. All right. Where he's talking about not so much. It's not so much a different 
exegesis. It's not a different exegesis. It's the biblical exegesis and showing, and showing the scripture's emphasis and momentum towards freedom and um, how that perfectly accords with the cruciform way of life that Paul described uh, all believers ought to have. Really good read. Um, another book uh, that I would recommend, uh, my wife's currently going through this one. Another book that I would recommend, uh, Propaganda's Terraform. All right, Propaganda's Terraform, Building a Better World. All right, and he, he's got a quote in here that I really like. You know, he says, uh, you know, he says, you know, culture is us and we are the culture, right? Culture is us and we are the culture. Um, you know, page 15 from the book, um, page 15 from the, or, you know, 14 and 15, I'm just going to read it. As a human race, we've been terraforming the whole time. We just kept doing it by telling horrible stories. Stories of power and glory and greed and injustice. As a result, Americans are currently polarized in a way we haven't been in decades. Neo-fascism is on the rise, and who even knows what the world even and who even knows what the word evangelical means anymore? Even in a global, let me say it again, global crisis, that is the 2020 COVID-19 outbreak, we couldn't see our way out of the ditches we've dug ourselves into where our position on the veracity of a virus is understood along party lines. But remember, we made up those rules. We can't blame culture. Culture is us. If we are culture and culture is us and we get to make it up, let's make it amazing. Now, a quick note to my faith-based readers. Don't just be like, it's sin and we need Jesus' book done. Come on, that's lame. The prophets of our holy texts had prophetic imaginations. They cast vision, gave specifics, told creation stories, appealed to history and to the faithfulness of their God. They terraformed their world. And it was sacred work. And it was sacred work work all right really really good read all right and i really like what he had to say about we need to tell better stories more truthful stories all right and how about this let's just get back to the history let's just get back to the history all right i mean you learned from i mean you heard you know my mom's statement on you know what juneteenth means to her and i fully laud and applaud that and you've even heard a little bit of what i was talking about juneteenth meaning to me but at its most basic at the bedrock level what juneteenth really symbolizes to me on top of everything else that's been said up to this point all right let me go ahead and fly over here all right uh, to the narrative of the life of frederick Douglass. right what oh man what juneteenth really symbolizes to me is it's one more proof of this ongoing battle this ongoing battle, spiritually and historically, really, um, to fight for the truth, one, of Jesus Christ, and two, um, in this American culture, to show that this American culture was never really a Christian culture. Not really. Not really. All right, people ask me all the time, Car, do you think America is a Christian nation or will say something about effect? And I'm like, no. I'm, no. It's not a Christian nation. You got a Christian nation owning slaves, practicing slavery, practicing segregation, practicing... How, how, how you got that? How? I don't see it. All right. So, you know, to that end, um, I wanted to... Uh, I wanted to just let Frederick Douglass... Frederick Douglass's appendix kind of round us off here, all right? Because I think this thing is a sermon all in and of itself, all right? So I am just going to read this appendix, all right? And let it wash over you, all right? Let it wash over you, all right? Written from a contemporary of, of our pre-modern era, back when slavery was practiced and legal and okay. All right, hear what he has to say. I find, since reading over the foregoing narrative, that I have, in several instances, spoken in such a tone and manner respecting religion as may possibly lead those unacquainted with my religious views to suppose me an opponent of all religion. To remove the liability of such misapprehension, I deem it proper to append the following brief explanation. What I have said respecting and against religion 
I mean strictly to apply to the slave holding religion of this land and with no possible reference to Christianity proper. For between the Christianity of this land and the Christianity of Christ, I recognize the widest possible difference, so wide that to receive the one as good, pure, and holy is of necessity to reject the other as bad, corrupt, and wicked. To the friend, to be the friend of the one is of necessity to be the enemy of the other. I love the pure, peaceable, and impartial Christianity of Christ. I therefore hate the corrupt, slave-holding, women-whipping, cradle-plundering, partial and hypocritical Christianity of this land. Indeed, I can see no reason but the most deceitful one for calling the religion of this land Christianity. I look upon it as the climax of all misnomers, the boldest of all frauds, and the grossest of all libels. Never was there a clearer case of stealing the livery of the court of heaven to serve the devil in. I am filled with unutterable loathing when I contemplate the religious pomp and show, together with the horrible inconsistencies which everywhere surround me. We have men stealers for ministers, women whippers for missionaries, and cradle plunderers for church members. The man who wields the blood-clotted cowskin during the week fills the pulpit on Sunday and claims to be a minister of the meek and lowly Jesus. The man who robs me of my earnings at the end of each week meets me as a class leader on Sunday morning to show me the way of life and the path of salvation. He who sells my sister for purposes of prostitution stands forth as the pious advocate of purity. He who proclaims it a religious duty to read the Bible denies me the right of learning to read the name of the God who made me. He who is the religious advocate of marriage robs whole millions of its sacred influence and leaves them to the ravages of wholesale pollution. The warm defender of the sacredness of the family relation is the same that scatters whole families, sundering husbands and wives, parents and children, sisters and brothers, leaving the hut vacant and the hearth desolate. We see the thief preaching against theft and the adulterer against adultery. We have men sold to build churches, women sold to support the gospel, and babes sold to purchase Bibles for the poor heathen, all for the glory of God and the good of souls. The slave auctioneer's bell and the church-going bell chime in with each other, and the bitter cries of the heartbroken slave are drowned in the religious shouts of his pious master. Revivals of religion and revivals in the slave trade go hand in hand together. The slave prison and the church stand near each other. The clanking of fetters and the rattling of chains in the prison and the pious psalm and solemn prayer in the church may be heard at the same time. The dealers in the bodies and souls of men erect their stand in the presence of the pulpit, and they mutually help each other. The dealer gives his blood-stained gold to support the pulpit, and the pulpit, in return, covers his infernal business with the garb of Christianity. Here, we have religion and robbery, the allies of each other, devils dressed in angels' robes, and hell presenting the semblance of paradise. Just God. And these are they who minister at thine altar, God of right? Men who their hands with prayer and blessing lay on Israel's ark of light. What? Preach and kidnap men? Give thanks and rob thy own afflicted poor? Talk of thy glorious liberty and then bolt hard the captive's door. What? Servants of thy own merciful son who came to seek and save the homeless and the outcasts, fettering down the tasked and plundered slave? Pilate and Herod friends, chief priests and rulers as of old combine, just God and holy, is that church which lends strength to the spoiler thine. The Christianity of America is a Christianity of whose votaries it may be as truly said as it was of the ancient scribes and Pharisees. They bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. All their works they do for to be seen of men, they love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues, and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, neither suffer you them that are entering to go in. You devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. Therefore you shall receive the greater damnation." 
You compass sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he's made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought you to have done and not to leave the other undone, you blind guides, which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they're full of extortion and excess. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like unto, whittle, unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and all of uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and inequity. Dark and terrible is this picture. I hold it to be strictly true of the overwhelming mass of professed Christians in America. They strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Could anything be more true of our churches? They would be shocked at the proposition of fellowshipping a sheep stealer, and at the same time they hug to their communion a man stealer, and brand me with being an infidel if I find fault with them for it. They attend with pharisaical strictness to the outward forms of religion, and at the same time neglect the weightier matters of religion. And and at the same time neglect the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. They are always ready to sacrifice, but seldom to show mercy. They are they who are represented as professing to love God whom they have not seen, whilst they hate their brother whom they have seen. They love the heathen on the other side of the globe. They can pray for him, pay money to have the Bible put into his hand, and missionaries to instruct him, while they despise and totally neglect the heathen at their own doors. Such is, very briefly my view of the religion of this land, and to avoid any misunderstanding growing out of the use of general terms, I mean by the religion of this land that which is revealed in the words, deeds, and actions of those bodies north and south calling themselves Christian churches, and yet in union with slaveholders. It is against religion, as presented by these bodies, that I have felt it my duty to testify. I conclude these remarks by copying the following portrait of the religion of the South, which is, by communion and fellowship, the religion of the North, which I soberly affirm is true to the life and without caricature or the slightest exaggeration. It is said to have been drawn several years before the present anti-slavery agitation began by a Northern Methodist preacher who, while residing at the South, had an opportunity to see slaveholding morals, manners, and piety with his own eyes. Shall I, not visit thee for the, shall I not visit for these things, saith the Lord? Shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? Come, saints and sinners, hear me tell how pious priests whip Jack and Nell, and women buy and children sell and preach all sinners down to hell, and sing of heavenly union. They'll bleat and bah, donna like goats, go gorge down black sheep and strain at moats, array their backs in fine black cloak coats, then seize their negroes by their throats, and choke for heavenly union. They'll church you if you sip a dram, and damn you if you steal a lamb, yet rob old Tony, Doll, and Sam of human rights and bread and ham, kidnappers, heavenly union. They'll loudly talk of Christ's reward, and bind his image with a cord, and scold and swing the lash abhorred, and sell their brother in the Lord to handcuffed heavenly union. They'll read and sing a sacred song and make a prayer both loud and long and teach the right and do the wrong, hailing the brother sister throng with words of heavenly union. We wonder how such saints can sing or praise the Lord upon the wing who roar and scold and whip and sting until their slaves and mammon cling in guilty conscience union. They'll raise tobacco, corn, and rye, and drive and thieve and cheat and lie, and lay up treasures in the sky by making switch and cowskin fly in hope of heavenly union. They'll crack old Tony on the skull and preach and roar like Bosh and Bull, or brying ass of mischief full, then seize old Jacob by the wool and pull for heavenly union. A roaring, ranting, sleek man thief who lived on mutton, veal, and beef, yet never would afford relief to needy, sable sons of grief was big with heavenly union. Love not the world, the preacher said, and winked his eye and shook his head. He seized on Tom and Dick and Ned, cut short their meat and clothes and bread, yet still loved heavenly union. Another preacher in whining spoke of one whose heart for sinners broke. He tied old nanny to an oak and drew the blood at every stroke and prayed for heavenly union. Two others oped their iron jaws and waved their children stealing paws. 
There sat their children in gewgaws. By stinting negroes' backs and maws, they kept up heavenly union. All good from Jack another takes, and entertains their flirts and rakes, who dress as sleek and glossy snakes, and cram their mouths with sweetened cakes. And this goes down for union. Sincerely and earnestly hoping that this little book may do something towards throwing light on the American slave system and hastening the glad day of deliverance to the millions of my brethren in bonds, faithfully relying upon the power of truth, love, and justice for success in my humble efforts, and solemnly pledging myself anew to the sacred cause, I subscribe myself, Fe Frederick Douglass, April 28, 1845. Now, has progress been made? Absolutely. Is there more to go? Definitely. Alright, and sure, it might not be expressed in the way that it was back in 1845, but if the last year, if the last year to two years has been obvious about one thing, it's that the same spirit that animated the animosity and the demonic false Christianity of the slaveholders back in Frederick Douglass's day is still in operation today in the hearts of many who would call themselves quote unquote Christian. And so for me, Juneteenth, while I do praise Jesus for it, I also praise Jesus for the fact that Juneteenth is a stark reminder that this nation in its origin was never a Christian nation. Never was. <clears throat> never was. There are Christians that lived in the nation at the time, as evidence right here. All right, but to say that this nation was a Christian nation, oh, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. There's only one kingdom of Christ. There's only one kingdom of Christ. And it doesn't fly the flag of the stars and stripes. There is only one kingdom of Christ. And it does not fly the flags of the stars and stripes. Alright, serve Jesus. Serve Jesus. Don't let this be you. Don't let the same spirit of hypocrisy that animated these Christians back then animate your Christianity, alright? You want to honor Jesus on this Juneteenth. You want to honor Jesus on every Juneteenth. All right? Then you pray to Jesus. Then you pray to Jesus that he reveals every last speck of hypocrisy in your life. Every last speck of apathy towards the suffering of another human being. And you pray that Jesus fills your heart with his heart. And changes your heart to match his heart towards the suffering of others in this world. Alright? There's a weighty one. There's a weighty one as far as table flippers go. But I don't think I'd have it any other way. I don't think I'd have it any other way. Happy Juneteenth, everyone. Peace.